Good morning and welcome to the regular session of Algon County Council. It is February the 27th, 2024, 9 a.m. and I will call this meeting to order. I'm going to ask Blaine Parkin to assume the meeting at this point. Thank you, Warden Ketchaba. I, uh, given the recent uh, circumstances, we've uh, asked our um, counterpart at the uh, municipality of West Elgin to uh, nominate or to have uh, their deputy mayor uh, fill in for uh, Councillor Latham, uh, given the circumstances. So I will ask Ms. Hellier to meet me at the podium, please. I trust Atelier, having been elected or appointed to the office of county councillor in the county of Elgin, do solemnly promise to declare that one, I will truthfully, faithfully, and impartially exercise this office to the best of my knowledge and ability. Two, I have not received and will not receive any payment or reward or promise thereof for the exercise of this office in a biased, corrupt, or in any other improper manner. Three, I will disclose any pecuniary interest direct or indirect in accordance with the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act. Four, I'll be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles III and make this solemn declaration conscientiously believing it to be true and knowing that it is of the same force and effect as if made under oath. Congratulations, Councillor Tellier, and welcome to the Horseshoe. Dear Chair, thank you so much. Moving on with our agenda, first up is the adoption of the minutes. Resolved that the minutes of the meeting held on February 13th, 2024 be adopted. Need a mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble will move and Councillor Hentz will second. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. And I was remiss. Welcome back, Catherine. I should have uh, mentioned that off the top of the meeting. Uh, good to have you back. Thank you. And uh, we look for good things. I would remember or remind members of any disclosure of pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof. I see none noted. Uh, next, moving into Committee of the Whole. Resolved that we do now move into Committee of the Whole. Do I have a mover and seconder for that? Deputy Warden Jones, did I see Councillor Noble seconding that? All in favor? That is carried. Brings us to section six, reports of councils, outside boards and staff. Six one from the Director of Human Resources, HR Policy 2.10, Alternative and Flexible Work Arrangements. Good morning, Amy. Good morning and through you, Mr. Warden, to members of council. Um, before council today is a redeveloped, sorry, non-union HR policy titled Alternative and Flexible Work Arrangements. To ensure inclusivity, all non-union staff were provided the opportunity to provide their feedback on what options would be most valued within such a policy. The executive leadership team reviewed the policy extensively to ensure it would be suitable across all service areas. And best practices were also reviewed, including a look at what neighboring and other progressive employers were offering at this time. And although many surrounding municipalities are trialing or have moved to a four day work week, we collectively felt that this would not work across the majority of county service areas at this time and much of the staff feedback agreed. So flexible work options are currently a significant recruitment and retention issue across all sectors and implementing this policy is anticipated to assist the county in recruiting and retaining qualified non-union staff. The policy provides a few options for alternative work arrangements, 
Knowing that there's no one size fits all approach, given the diversity of staff and service requirements. The intent is to provide varied options that will only be approved when suitable for the roles and departments. As stated within the report and throughout the policy, operational and customer service requirements will always come first, and there must never be a reduction in service related to flexible work arrangements. The newly developed policy continues to address the intent um, of the prior overtime in lieu and alternative worker arrangements policies that were approved by council a little over a year ago. And the intent of those were to ensure there was a cap on lieu time banks so that these amounts could never reach an unmanageable amount or create an unfunded liability. The newly drafted policy does not allow the bank to grow beyond 21 hours at any given time. So that's up to three days of hours. Um, and it promotes the intended behavior of planning time off when we know we're gonna have to be working additional hours, whether it's meetings outside of regular business or um, workload increases. And our new HCM system will include a cap that won't allow individuals to bank any more time than the 21 hours capped, thus forcing the time to be booked off before any additional hours can be accrued. Department heads are responsible for ensuring fair and consistent policy application while prioritizing service delivery and all alternative schedules will need to be pre-approved. So true overtime should only occur in extenuating circumstances. The policy we recommend rescinding was developed following the cyber event that we experienced where some staff worked excessive hours. In future emergency or extenuating circumstances, HR will be closely monitoring staff hours, ensuring health and safety of staff is the top priority. HR will ensure accurate tracking of time worked and that appropriate breaks are taken. And we recommend paying staff per the clearly established Employment Standards Act overtime policies, whereby non-management staff who work in excess of 44 hours per week will receive payment at time and a half for those hours. So the recommendation before council is to adopt the newly developed policy and rescind the prior HR policy 2.10, as well as HR policy 2.21 covering non-union overtime. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that report, Amy. Does anyone have any questions uh, for staff? <clears throat> Okay, sounds like uh, you've done a pretty good job of uh, satisfying people's expectations. So thank you. Ready for a question? Resolved that County Council adopt the new HR policy 2.10 alternative and flexible work arrangements as presented on February 27th, 2024, and that County Council rescind HR policy 2.21 overtime and loo time. Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Council. Mr. Widner and Councillor Crooked will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Section 6.2, Director of Homes and Senior Services, Homes, Emergency Plans, Elgin County, and Dutton Cooperative Child Care Center, Inc. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Mr. Warden. Through you to members of Council, um, so the report before you today is to seek council approval for execution of an agreement with the Corporation of the County of Algon, specifically Bobier Villa and the Dutton Cooperative Child Care Center uh, for the use of each other's facilities uh, for the purpose of a safe receiving area in the event of a temp that a temporary evacuation is required. So both long-term care home legislation and the daycare legislation uh, require that uh, both facilities have plans, emergency plans in place that comply with their regu regulatory requirements. And those requirements include the identification of a safe evacuation location, the use of which needs to be arranged in advance of an emergency. So staff at both facilities have toured both Bobier Villa and the Dutton Child Care Center to determine both the feasibility and the suitability of temporary evacuation for both. In consultation with the county solicitor, I've reached consensus with the child care uh, representatives for a, a draft agreement 
uh, which was included in this report to support temporary evacuation and emergency plans for both facilities. Uh, staff do recommend that council authorize execution of the MOU to support emergency planning requirements for both Bobier Villa and the Child Care Centre. And the recommendations are before you, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for that report, Michelle. Does anyone have any questions? Seeing none, we'll now have to question. Resolved that the report titled Homes Emergency Plans, Elgin County and Dutton Cooperative Child Care Center Incorporated, dated February 27th, 2024, be received and filed, and that council authorize the Director of Homes and Senior Services to execute the Memorandum of Understanding for Emergency Planning with Corporation of the County of Elgin and Dutton Cooperative Child Care Center Incorporated. Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Deputy Warden Jones will move. Councillor Hentz will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Moving on to 6-3 from the Chief Administrative Officer, Clerk. Growth Planning Steering Committee recommended terms of reference. Good morning, Blaine. Good morning, Warden. Uh, and through you to members of Council, uh, this is just a, a short report confirming that uh, the terms of reference that were discussed and uh, adopted by the Growth Planning Steering Committee uh, and read being recommended to Council for adoption, those terms of reference uh, were designed with the intent of trying to take a broader, more holistic view on uh, growth throughout the county and um, giving uh, aligning the, with the mandate that council previously adopted and providing some direction to the growth planning steering committee. So those terms of reference include examining issues, challenges and opportunities resulting from the province's strategic investments in the region, developing a strategy for managing growth throughout the county, which includes managing the challenges and leveraging the benefits associated with that growth, identifying key infrastructure needs in the region to facilitate growth, working to ensure that the county, the local municipal partners, the city of St. Thomas, as well as the provincial and federal governments work collectively for the benefit for the region and all its residents and businesses, promoting a holistic view to the planning and coordination of growth throughout the county, demonstrating county council's commitment to responsible and sustainable growth that considers both financial and environmental factors, and working to ensure that the investment in growth is proportional to the benefit derived from growth, and conversely, that those who benefit from growth proportionately invest. So with that, Warden Ketchup, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that uh, report, Blaine. Does anyone have any questions? Everyone's comfortable with that? So far, it's been relatively easy this morning. Okay, uh, Catherine, please. Results that the Council of the Corporation of the County of Elgin received the report entitled Growth Planning Steering Committee Recommended Terms of Reference, dated February 27th, 2024, and that Council adopt the terms of reference as recommended by the Growth Planning Steering Committee. Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Councillor Jaguer and Councillor Cookett uh, will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Which brings us to 6 4, the Director of Financial Services. Treasurer regarding the 2024 proposed county budget. This one may not be as easy. Good morning, Mr. Warden. Through you to members of council. I wait for the presentation. I'm happy to bring forward the 2024 budget to council for approval today um, from the budget committee on behalf of the budget committee and staff. Uh, our first slide next is the schedule that we um, went through. So we started our budget process in September with the budget co committee and they reviewed the um, budget survey that we sent out to the public. So that was our first um, public engagement opportunity this year. And that went from uh, September 13th to uh, October 13th. At that time, um, the leadership team during October was also busy working on their budgets behind the scenes and taking into consideration um, the information that was gathered through that survey. 
Um, in October, the budget committee met to um, review the results of that survey and um, a preliminary look at the risks and opportunities that we were facing for the 2024 budget. Uh, in November, um, the budget committee met and heard the engineering services capital plan. Uh, an in-depth review of that capital plan was um, given. Um, so we do look at our budget for 10 years, so capital and operating, and the capital plan was pro provided along with their 2024 operational plan as well. Uh, November 28th, uh, we met again with the budget committee and all of the departments then provided their presentation uh, to the budget committee uh, through a draft release of, of their budget package. Um, in January, the budget committee met again and we talked about uh, some changes that we had heard about because there was still some outstanding things from no the November meeting. And we also talked about um, some of the items that were um, still um, outstanding. So those rates and ratios were then uh, reviewed and we brought forward our uh, preliminary uh, amount of 3.79% uh, as our increase for 2024. Uh, then we went for a, a period of public consultation again, where we held another public meeting um, on February 13th from five to seven, where the um, public was welcome to come and provide their input to our budget. Um, and there was also a survey online where we received um, many comments related to the budget, approximately 35 comments were received. And then today we are here with the budget, the final presentation. Um, so from the public engagement, the budget survey, um, as I said, was from September 13th to October 13th. It was posted online and available in person. We heard 20, 220 individuals responded and 91% of these individuals identified as residential res re individuals that would fall under the residential rate. The top three priorities that were identified by respondents um, that we should focus on was social services and housing, long-term care, and transportation and roads. Uh, next, acceptable ways to increase spending um, were to keep taxation between 0% and 4%, lean on efficiencies and funding, and take out some long-term debt if needed, but that would be a last resort. Uh, fewer tax dollars uh, should be spent on grants and support for community programs and events, cultural services and discretionary funding. And many of the respondents wanted to have more information about that. So how did we respond to the survey? Um, last year, the consumer price index, October over October, was 3.3%, and that's the percentage that many of our contracts are based on. Uh, so that does fuel a lot of our budget process, uh, knowing that we have to meet that um, budget target, that target of CPI. So with the proposed tax rate this year, we're looking at a 3.79%. So we're in we're in uh, the vicinity of the 3.3%. Uh, I provided the last three years uh, in comparator for the budget and the CPI October over October. So in 2021, uh, we were at a 2.9 increase in our tax rate with a CPI of a 0.7%. In 2022, we were at a 1.68% increase with CPI at 4.9. And in 2023, we're at 3.75% with a CPI of 6.5. And this year, 3.79 with a 3.3% CPI. So we haven't had um, a lot of years where we are extremely over that amount. And how did um, the budget respond to the survey? Further information, financial. Um, council were very engaged in the budget process this year, and many did attend the budget meetings uh, throughout the budget process. So that um, helps them stay informed and um, 
makes our, our life a little easier as we go through this process so that they um, understand some of the pressures and uh, are engaged in that at, at the budget committee level. Line items were reviewed by all departments. Um, increases lower than the CPI increase, which we see that in several areas, signal that an efficiency in that area has been achieved and in order to contain increases on that line item. And in appendix one of the budget document that you have, um, it outlines line by line the details for each department so that if you have interest in a particular department, you can go through that and determine uh, where the savings or cost increases were related. Departmental presentations highlighted this year that um, in engineering, we had a revised capital plan of $23 million. Um, that was actually a decrease from the prior 10-year plan. We had, I believe, $26 million in there for 2024, and we were able to decrease it down to 2023 um, with, by, by changing that plan a little bit. The fire school has one new full-time fully offset by revenue person. So that person will be fully um, compensating. So it will still remain as a revenue neutral um, ad. And since this, uh, since this was introduced, council has approved that person be um, hired. So that process is in, in progress at this time. Planning department. Um, we've introduced the shared service, uh, so we're looking to hire one full-time person um, in order to provide shared services for our municipality so that we can um, uh, build that department and also assist in the fact that planners, there is a shortage of planners out there and everyone is struggling to um, hire that uh, particular um, in that particular area. Human resources um, changed the scope of one existing position. So they did have a position that um, was doing a shared service with Middlesex and that position is no longer required. So that scope changed in order to provide um, a little bit of a more expertise for negotiation purposes and in order to assist Amy with some of her challenges in that department. Uh, facilities are still following their building a condition assessment that we did uh, a couple of years ago. So um, the Terrace Lodge rebuild is still underway under that department um, with debt expected to be incurred in 2025. And our elevator project is nearing completion, which is due in 2024. Uh, one of the other significant um, areas, we added about $1.3 million of service to um, the ambulance services. Uh, and this is a shared service, which is partially offset cost. Those costs are partially offset eventually by the province who does pick up 50%, um, but that is one year behind. And then also by our municipal partners, um, the city of St. Thomas in that area. So. So some other line items um, that represent uh, shared services are the public health unit, ambulance and social services. And in these budget areas, um, these are externally uh, legislated to us. So we have external partners with contracted services. So in most cases, those budgets are prescribed to us, um, things that are required that they need um, to meet the legislative requirements of their service. Um, an overarching review of the departmental discretionary funding and non-discretionary funding was conducted this year by the budget committee. And that was at the request of the survey, plus to make sure that we were focusing on our core needs for um, the County of Elgin. And that is in appendix two of the budget document. So you're able to see all of the items that were reviewed. And um, as we went into this process, we received many requests for funding 
um, from external groups in 2024. And as council knows, these requests were forwarded to the budget committee for review and consideration. Discretionary items. So in um, appendix two, as I mentioned, uh, we do have the discretionary items um, are outlined for you. And if I can liken this to um, a discretionary item would be like shopping at Walmart where you have your grocery aisles, those are your core services. And then you can veer out of those lines and go over to the toy department and maybe the, the clothing department and pick up a few extra things. Um, whereas non-discretionary items are just like shopping at Food Basics. You have your core items, your food, your milk, your sugar. Those are the things that you need in order to function in your household. So the budget committee did review many of the pressures that we have going on into this year, as well as pressures next year and beyond. So non-discretionary items um, include um, in 2025, we show that we have some pressures with funding shortfall of 5.1 million, and that's in the 10-year plan. If you look at the summary on page two, you'll see that there is a shortfall for 2022 and 2026, a shortfall of another approximately $5 million. This is related in part to the large debt that's coming online for Terrace Lodge, which staff have been preparing for. Um, we have planned to use um, the compliance premium that the province will be giving us for Terrace Lodge. However, um, you can still see that we are short um, in order to meet our obligations in those two years. Um, what could we do with any extra money? We could ensure that we can service our needs and pay our debt. So for instance, um, if we were to see interest rates come down, that would help us and we could put some more money towards the repayment of the debt. So for instance, um, if we had another 600,000 per year in additional debt repayment, we would be able to reduce the number of years, probably from about 25 years down to 15 years. And we would save approximately $8 million in doing that. This would be timely because um, approximately in 15 years, Bobier Villa will be 40 years old and we will be looking at probably the replacement of that facility um, related to our long-term care needs. Um, in the HR department uh, for 2024, union negotiations are still ongoing and these have not settled yet. So we did put in um, a provision in the 2024 budget and you'll see a discretionary, uh, a non-discretionary item in there for um, that purpose. However, we're not sure that this is actually the full amount that we will need. Um, we're hopeful, but we're not that we don't know that yet. Um, recently, we lobbied for more infrastructure funding from the province uh, to assist with the pressures of growth in this community. Yet we heard Minister Flack allude to the fact that in order to make this area successful, we will all have to incur debt. And we don't know what that exactly means at this time. Um, when will that happen? What does that look like? Um, so we don't know. Um, and only thing we can do is try to prepare in advance for whatever that might in involve. Um, some discretionary items that um, we have um, are non-core services, um, outside agency asks that will have and have caused scope, scope creep and expectations. So these are also listed in appendix two. And in 2024, the community came forward with many large asks that were not within our core budget area. And the committee um, debated, but unanimous, unanimously voted to bring forward the budget without these items included today. Um, so that um, I have not included them as a result. Um, so from the slide, the core, the core um, large items were the provisions uh, for funding from the hospital in the amount of 500,000 and the hospice for 300,000. So these were not included. If we were to add these onto the levy, and that would be either today or in the future when we don't have the money that we um, would plan to give away, uh, approximately 2% is what these would cost um, our, our rate payers. Um, so this is, again, not a core service. And long-term care and Southwest Public Health are already 
um, overspent uh, to their funding and do put pressures every year on our Elgin County area. Um, but these are services that are mandated to be supported by the county taxpayer. And so they are within our budget. Um, it is necessary to remain focused on core services, especially during these periods of growth. And it is also important to note that taxpayers are not eligible for tax receipts if they are taxed directly through their property and not um, you know, donating that readily to the individual areas. So two items that are still um, on the agenda for council's consideration, um, which the committee could not decide upon would be SCORE, which is $30,000. Um, last year, their request was granted at $25,000, but this year they're asking for 30. And the St. Thomas Algon Public Arts Gallery, um, their core service has been uh, supported at 30,000. And this year, their membership is going up to 40,000. So they're asking for a $10,000 increase. So these will be two things that um, today the council will have to determine if they wish to provide funding for those. Um, 2023 growth. So in uh, 2023, we, we did have a large unexpected uh, growth. And this was um, related to the commercial area of our um, tax base. So we're very thankful for those individuals that have uh, found their way to Algon County and have now uh, built their home here and built their businesses here. And these, uh, this does provide us with a large um, amount for this year in particular. Um, the assessment base grew 4.9%, uh, with 2.5% of this being commercial assessment. And that results in about $2.5 million. Half of this is a possible um, at risk is possibly at risk. There, there is a potential for um, assessment uh, re appeal, and until that appeal is completed and known, um, we do not know whether or not we have set aside enough or maybe too much. So, um, at this point, we we've, we've chosen the halfway point. So uh, we're suggesting that uh, one point two. 9.5 or 1.3 million be set aside into a growth re or into a reassessment reserve that we would not touch until we know the outcome of any reassessment. And then also set aside the other half of that into what we have been doing every year is the growth reserve. So what we've been doing is taking the growth from the prior year, setting it aside into the growth reserve and then um, allowing that to uh, flow through as needed into the next year. Um, at this point, um, the council council um, has um, supported that, the growth reserve in order to, in lieu of development charges, we don't have those here at the county. So we have been trying to squirrel away a bit of money here and there in order to support the growth that's coming. Um, and our development charges are compiled um, and made of municipal core services. So I went back to the DC um, study that was done by Hampson in 2021. And services that we can uh, support are services related to highway and transportation, ambulance, library, long-term care, and provincial offenses. Those were the only ones that they had identified in that report. Uh, currently, there is uh, $4 million in our growth reserve, and that is in, we only started it in 2022. It's a very young reserve. However, um, the first year we put a half a million dollars in there. And then in the second year, we plan to put a 0.7 mil or 700,000 in, but we did have a large surplus uh, in 2022. So we did put a lot uh, put 3.5 million in there. So that's how we got to our um, $4 million. In Appendix 2, um, we're just showing here that we did present the committee with three options for uh, rate reduction. Uh, 3.79 shows the growth um, reserve going to 2 million with 1.2 
or 1.3 million set aside in the res reassessment reserve. In option two, we allowed half of that growth to flow through to the rate payer, which would have brought down our um, rate to 2.36, um, still leaving uh, 1.3 in the reassessment reserve, but um, that would then change the growth reserve and it would fall to 1.4. Option three, um, we had reduced it significantly um, to 1% approximately with only the growth from the current year um, that was not related to commercial flowing through um, to, to the growth reserve and then all the commercial being released into use for this year. Uh, the committee eventually chose option one, feeling that that was um, a good way to set us up for the future. And um, it provides um, some savings to the tax rate payer. They're not, they're not um, a large amount, but um, if the additional non-municipal costs were, were added to this flow, we would not, the rate payer would not see the gain in allowing that to flow through. So um, we're focusing on our own core, core um, assets and that um, in the accounting circles, if we flow this through and we give it away, um, it's known as a lost opportunity. So that's something that we don't want to, we want to avoid that. And we want to ensure that the value of uh, what we have is something that we have for a long time that we can re rely on and use. So currently we have the budget set at 3.79% for an increase. Um, this puts our levy at $48 million um, when, the, when the, inter, the inflation rate is 3.3%. Um, on the average home, that results in $25 per 100,000 of assessment. In the county, um, the average home is 239000 so that would be approximately $59.75 on the average home, approximately $60. In this scenario, uh, 1.3 million of growth from the commercial class is being set aside for reassessment. All the growth from all the classes are, putting, are being put into the growth reserve and no new commercial class assessment is flowing into 2024. So um, the revenue, uh, this is just an overview of how we're, we're receiving our revenue. 48% uh, of it is uh, coming from taxes. The overall revenue that we will receive is 101.6 million. Um, 29, 29 million is coming from long-term care. So there's a lot of user fees and provincial funding in that envelope. Um, emergency management, which is our ambulance, um, approximately 11.5 million from our, our partners. And then the rest, um, we have some uh, OSIF and, and that type of funding that comes in for um, engineering. Uh, in the operating costs, um, operating expenses are expected to be 89.6 million. 76.9 million is um, for core services, 12.7 million is amortization, and that is used to support capital replacement. Um, the capital expenses this year are 24.6 million, and that is supported in part by um, the net income and by the amortization. Of course, you see our largest is in um, roads, which is 19 million, and then some of our other um, areas. So as we near the end of the budget process, uh, the rates and ratios are finalized in OPTA, which is the Ontario Property Tax Analysis Group. Um, there's a portal and in advance of the bylaw being struck for council's approval, I have um, populated OPTA to ensure that the ratios and rates are correct. Um, the landfill ratio for Allen County is prescribed to us 
and is adjusted by the Minister of Finance. Um, this can happen up until the data is frozen in June. And if it, it would um, be changed, we would bring back an additional report with, a, um, out with the effects on the ratios and the rates if and when that happened. Uh, ratios are currently confirmed to pass the upload and therefore are expected to be within the range of fairness for each of the classes. So adjustments are not anticipated. Um, but as I said, the cutoff for that is the end of June and that was prescribed by the province. Um, and Elgin tax rate um, increase remains at 3.79% um, to reflect the opt to calculate amounts today. The next one is just the uh, ratios. They remain unchanged from the prior year. And the rates today um, for each of the classes are increasing by the 3.79% as um, outlined today. So we did have a period of um, a second public consultation um, the draft proposed budget was posted on our website from February 8th um, to February 15th. And we did hold a public meeting on February 13th from 7 to 9 p.m. A uh, delegation was received from the hospital and they attended to further discuss options within the budget to fund their MRI campaign. And questions from the, on, from the online posted budget document were received and answered by the senior leadership team as it related to their area of expertise. After the public meeting, the county did receive a request for the link to the public feedback survey from Hospice Algen, and multiple respondents then engaged in the survey to pro provide their support for the county to also fund the hospice campaign. Um, in relation to that survey, 34 um, responses were received and the highlights are the community and cultural services. The budget was too high. They wanted to keep the budget overall lower than 3%. Uh, more funding was supposed to be given to land ambulance. And we, as previously mentioned, we had increased that budget by 1.3 million this year. Homes um, to keep the budget increases uh, at or below inflation. Transportation, um, there is some discussion about various road safety and bicycle lanes. Uh, human resources, uh, there was um, a request to engage more with our local municipal partner staff via events. Tourism, um, there was a, for a request to fund areas that improve tourism initiatives with like park benches and signage, and that we do through our CIP program. Uh, hospice, um, there was some more comments uh, related to funding the capital project in the hospital as well, more comments related to funding their capital project. And these are all provided for you in Appendix C. Um, if you want to look at a full overview of those. So the recommendations um, are provided today um, for you in order to um, make your decisions related to the budget, um, um, that the membership for SCORE be approved at 30,000, that the additional funding for STPAC membership in the amount of 10,000 be approved or not approved for the 2024 budget, that the 2024 budget um, outline in the proposed draft budget document, which is in Appendix A, um, we will tidy that up, take the drafts off and make that the final document with the proposed tax rate of 3.79%. And I have provided the budget bylaw today, should there be no further changes to um, the budget, which is uh, provided as Appendix D, um, 202407. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I do have my friends from the executive leadership team here so that if there's anything I can't answer, they certainly um, will be able to do that. Okay, Jennifer, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. A lot of work has gone into this uh, from not only yourself and uh, your, uh, your finance department, but the senior leadership team. 
Uh, at this point, I also want to thank the uh, the budget committee for their input on this and the general public for uh, any consultation that they've brought forward as well. Uh, the one thing I do want to note, and I thank you for providing the uh, the bylaw, but I'm thinking that as per procedure, the bylaw will not be considered today. So I would say the council just consider it for information. It'll be brought forward at a future meeting. That's standard practice. And at this point, I'm going to open it up to uh, council members. Uh, your comments, uh, questions, concerns, and let's have a discussion. So uh, Deputy Warden Jones. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, just uh, some concerns. I, I guess maybe it's a misunderstanding on my part. Um, I'm not sure. I kind of gathered through the committee process that the two large asks from the hospital and the hospice would be discussed by county council today. Mm -hmm. um, and still support both. Um, I think it should be included in some way, whether it's a reduced amount, but my understanding was the hospital asked for uh, 250 over 10 years was a concession on their part, not 500 over five, um, which would change that aspect of it. But I think it behooves us to put some money into this. Um, I, the reality is, I think this started with the McGinty government, the downloading of uh, some of our costs to with hospitals uh, at that point that hasn't changed over many years that that download has happened. Um, I think that's reality. And I think we need to recognize that reality. Yeah, it probably should be a provincial problem, but it, it's turned into our problem. Um, I still feel that we should have a discussion about these two options and uh, whether it's the full amount or a reduced amount, but I think we have to do it in some way. All right, thank you for your comments, Deputy Warden. Anyone else? Councilor Crooked. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, I'm sure you to, uh, I guess, a comment, a uh, number of comments. Uh, I, I want to support the, uh, the suggestion made by uh, Deputy Warden Jones that uh, we should be discussing as, as a council the uh, inclusion of uh, funds for supporting the uh, MRI project and the uh, palliative care project as well. Um, no doubt the budget committee had to face some very difficult decisions. And uh, I can understand uh, the fact that they would leave these out, but as, as Deputy Warden Jones mentioned, uh, the ask of 500,000, this is the first time I've seen that. Uh, you know, I've heard the request from the hospital uh, for 250,000, which would reduce the, uh, the amount considerably uh, that uh, the county would have to be uh, um, good for. There's a lot of discussion um, about the budget and about core values. And sometimes the word mandated uh, uh, requirements for uh, the county are mentioned. Uh, we do carry a number of items uh, in the county that are not mandated, um, the library being one of them. It's not a mandated uh, requirement. However, if I, I would be the first to say we have to do it. Um, but, you know, we we need to support th this this hospital. Um, I'm looking at the, the the comment made that discretionary kinds of uh, payments or discretionary kind of uh, support um, is equivalent to toys at Walmart. But I really don't think that, you know, when, we, when we're looking at MRI or we're looking at palliative care, that they really are something that, you know, you can kind of equate to, to toys. Um, and so that my comment, um, I do have a question, however, on page 39 and 40 of the agenda, it talks about option two. And the statement is, and maybe I've missed it somewhere, the statement says use of the growth reserve in option number two was a suggested course of action in order to maintain the county's historical support of hospital capital needs. That, that implying that option two includes support for uh, 
hospital capital needs. I did not see the that figure anywhere else other than this. So is that, I'm not sure what that means. Jen, would you take that one, please? Um, through you, Mr. Warren, to Councillor Cookett. At the presentation provided by the hospital, uh, it was their suggestion that we would take the 600000 that we would plan to flow through into the county uh, budget and not reduce the tax rate. It would go to the core, it would go to the hospital uh, to fund the hospital um, capital project. So the rate payers would not um, gain that lower tax rate. I, I don't have anything in the budget right now for hospital and hospice. Just to clarify, uh, Councillor Cook, uh, what uh, the suggestion was, rather than uh, so rather than uh, attributing the full portion over to the growth rate, you would use part of that to fund these uh, discretionary programs. You would still be looking at a three point seven nine percent tax rate, and that would take care of twenty four. Then we'll see what happens in twenty five. No. I. I think uh, we've got some valuable discussion going on here. I'm going to be a devil's advocate, and I'm going to uh, throw this out there and ask, uh, is council prepared then to fund expansionary programs in the other hospitals that are used by county residents? I'm talking Newberry. I'm talking Tilsonburg. Deputy Warden. I guess... Uh... Uh, Mr. Warden, uh, we have no control over that, no more than we have control over our long-term care homes who comes into our long-term care homes. So I, I think that's really irrelevant to, to some degree. Um, yes, it is an issue, but mm -hmm. it's, it goes both ways, right? Uh, people come to us as well, London, down to St. Thomas all the time. So, Well, thank you for that. I, again, I'm just throwing the, being a devil's advocate out here. Uh, we do participate in a lot of health care funding in the county, perhaps is uh, something that we inherited, as you say, through the McGinty days or even the Harris days. Uh, but we do support long-term care to the extent of over $5.8 million. We support uh, ambulance care, well over $5 million. Uh, Southwest Public Health, $1.8 million, or that's what the ask is. The uh, Health Recruitment Partnership. I believe is it one point two nine? Is that what we're asking, Jen? Uh, health recruitment is a hundred thousand. A hundred and yeah, but it's it grew from seventy thousand. Yes, it's up. It's up. Point I'm trying to make is we're assuming a larger and larger role all the time, and I agree with the, the consensus perhaps around the table that it really isn't funded appropriately. You know, the the property tax bucket it should be from an ability to pay bucket, but we are nonetheless in the healthcare business. Councillor Noble. Uh, Mr. Warden, um, well, I, I see that the hospital is important and, and planning is mm -hmm. very important. There's also an email that's circulating right now that the, uh, the hospital is planning on building a new hospital across the street. I just got wind of that this week. So if we're going to spend some time doing some planning and, and giving a bunch of money out, maybe we should have the rest of the facts. I don't know if anybody else was aware of that. I was not aware of that. That's interesting. I don't know if anyone else is aware of that either. Uh, Deputy Warden Jones. Uh, I, I'm not sure where that email came from because my understanding of the planning horizon for hospitals over 20 years. So mm. um, it's not time, anytime soon, that's for sure. Right. Any other comments? I realize we're talking about the big ticket items at the moment. Uh, Councilor Shiger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, my take on this is that I feel that we lack the tools to make decision and, um, and I will include everything from a 250,000 ask to a 1000 ask a 10,000 ask a 15,000 ask mm -hmm. that are here and there. We have grants, we have requests for sponsorships later today, we have hospital and we also have a growing growth reserve. Mm -hmm. So I can see, you know, outside looking in for, you know, those who are uh, in support of all of these are very valuable. I have yet to receive a request that was not valuable and is not contributing something really important and needed in the community. So we get all of these requests over here. Everybody can see our growth reserve is growing and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. 
what we are missing is a process to connect the dots. I do not feel comfortable acting subjectively and emotionally on, you know, here's 15,000, here's 6,000 that we heard at the last meeting, or here's 250. Where does that end? Where does that begin? And where does that end? So I would like clearer and perhaps the best way, because where would that money come from if we were to um, support these requests? My guess is it would be from the growth reserve. That growth reserve has no guidelines around it. We started it, and now I think it's grown enough that it does require further discussion. So my suggestion would be to take a step back, go and to spend some time figuring out the parameters of that growth reserve. I suspect because it's been connected to development charges, it's growth, you know, supports mm -hmm. pays for growth. You could argue that the needs of the hospice and the hospitals are related to growth. But again, these would all be, to me, a little bit arbitrary, subjective, individual. Um, we don't have around the table a clear agreement even on core versus discretionary. And it, it appears like there's uh, some differences, there's some gray areas. So that would be my suggestion, is that we step back, develop some policies and parameters around the use and criteria around the use of the growth reserve, and then reapply, review all of these big asks, uh, applying that criteria so that it becomes a little bit more transparent, clear, and objective. Uh, before we go forward, I'm going to ask uh, Jennifer, with respect to the growth reserve and the, uh, the establishment of it, were there some policies and parameters put onto that? Or was it simply just a holding fund? At the time it was established, it was established as in lieu of development charges. Mm -hmm. I think um, there has been no specific parameters put on it and staff would welcome that because I think as Councillor Jaguer said, the outside world is looking at that as a windfall. It's not a windfall. It's for our future development. And so uh, we need to be looking at it from our, for ourselves to say, you know, this is for our future. This is what we are building so that we can accommodate all the things that are coming down the line and um, to just give it away to, for, for immediate asks, what, what, like what parameters and what, what guidelines are we doing that under? I also feel like, what is, is there a limit on the ask? Like, should there be some sort of, yeah, you you can't come for a large amount like that. Like, what are what are the parameters? We don't really have any any parameters to say. Like, is it going to go to outside groups? Is it going to just be for roads? Is it going to be like these are the things that we don't even have the answers to, and so it does. It is subjective, and um, I I think that staff would welcome the ability to bring forward a policy or a report that would. Um, even for all of our reserves, like capital reserve, we use for capital purposes internally, but the growth reserve is definitely not, um, it's for capital, but what capital? Before I get to you, Deputy Warden, I would agree with that. And I think uh, perhaps a more definitive parameters around what the purpose of the fund is for would be helpful. Definitely uh, for help guiding the discussion. Um, so I would welcome that actually. I think it would be valuable. Deputy Warden. I agree wholeheartedly. I, and I'll get on the bandwagon again. Uh, this is the third term of council. We've talked about development charges and I'll push it again. It's something we should have had two terms ago and this, we wouldn't really be having this discussion at this point because uh, like Jen uh, pointed out, the lion's share of those development charges, what we can ask money for are exactly what we're discussing right now. So I think it should be part of the discussion uh, whether we go forward with development charges because that's gonna alleviate a lot of this, these uh, discussions that, that there should be money set aside for this stuff. And um, if we'd done it eight years ago, I think we'd be a lot better off at this point. Okay, then a question back to anyone. 
is had we had development charges, they would be restricted funds as well, not available for non or for discretionary funding. Right? So this is where if you want to apply development charges parameters to the growth reserve, same thing. It's not available for non, you know, for non-core business. It would be for roads, ambulances. You say libraries, I assume that means purchase of materials, not buildings. Uh, I would and the other was long-term care. But Elgin is not a full service municipality. So that's one thing to keep in mind. I mean, I think it's valuable having that discussion again. No problem. But in lieu of the DCs, this is what the uh, growth reserve is for. Future growth. But we don't have any parameters on it. So perhaps it is wise to have that policy come forward as well. Councillor Cookett. Thank you, Mr. Warden. In terms of uh, looking at the, at the growth reserve and looking at asks those are two different kinds of things and i agree mm -hmm. that we should have some kind of a uh, some kind of a policy dealing with uh, the amount of asks that we would entertain um you know town of elmer just did that kind of thing this year we had all kinds of asks and finally this year we said we're going to put a cap on the amount of money that we're going to provide for asks so that's one area the other area the, the growth reserve well it could have its own uh, kind of guidelines, but those are two separate things. However, none of that solves the issue of what we're going to do with them, with the MRI and the palliative care this year. And and uh, I would like to put something on the floor that says we, we at least have a motion that we accept or deny in terms of, um, of this. And so option number two, which I understand really does include money for the hospital and for palliative care because it's taken out of the growth fund. Does it not include money in option number two? There's nothing there. I, I thought that's what the warden said a while back, so I misunderstood that. So uh, in order to put this on the floor, you need a motion that says that we would um, provide the hospital with, uh, with you know, $250,000 for MRI and uh, palliative care for 200,000. And I'd be willing to make that motion just to put it on the floor. Okay. Okay. Pardon me. Ah, Councillor Sloan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I apologize that I'm at a committee. I hope you can hear me. We can hear you. Thank you, Warden. Uh, quick question for you, Warden. Um, it says today that the hospital has 5.7 raised of the $8 million asked. We're not talking about 250,000, we're talking about 2,500,000, if I'm not correct, is the ask. So that takes over their budget. As for hospice, um, there hasn't been an ask, maybe, although uh, uh, Ms. Ford said there was some lobbying over the weekend by both parties. I wanna say that I agree with, or with Councillor Jaguar that what are the parameters? How, how important is one versus another? And if, if something like Terrace Lodge were in the mix, which is super important to us, I'm not sure how the fundraising for that went, whether they went to municipalities and asked them. But if you're looking at the, when the government offers uh, money to individuals or to groups like the hospital, um, there's a certain portion that has to be raised from the general public as opposed to other arms of government. At least that was the, the, the understanding that I had. Um, but to, to that point, I, I don't feel comfortable knowing how much we would either give to the hospital or to the hospice one looks like it's going to meet their, in fact, surpass their ask if we give $2.5 million uh, over 10 years, while the other one, I'm not sure if the 500,000 actually helps them meet their needs. So um, those are my comments, Warden. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that. Jen. Uh, to, to clarify, Mr. Warden, through you to Councillor Sloan, um, the hospice did come forward and ask for 300,000 for four years. So approximately 1.2 million was their ask. All right, thank you for that clarification. Okay. Any, let's go back and deal uh, with Councillor Cockett. Uh, you put a motion on the floor specifically. Have you got something written down, Catherine? Kind of. 
okay, we are trying to get the intent of what you're asking. Now, considering that uh, there's been an ask out there of uh, putting some parameters on what exactly a growth fund means, are you sure you want to put that motion on the floor today? And I would have to ask for clarification from someone. My understanding was they were looking, the hospital specifically, for two and a half million over five years. Was there any documentation suggesting over 10 years? I would, I would like to see that. The original ask from the hospital, Mr. Warden, through you to council was 2.5, 500,000, five years. Yes. This, the hospice came forward, 1.2 million, four years, 300,000. Those came to council. Council sent that to budget committee. Mm -hmm. So then when we were in public consultation, um, the request from hospital was that they could compromise for 10 years at 250,000. Um, the suggestion was to take it out of the funds that we were supposedly set aside for option two. Um, uh, that would not see any um, change to the rate. It would still be 3.79%. It would just be that we would be flowing the money through to the hospital and to the, to the MRI program or to the hospital MRI and the hospice fund. Um, those would not have any um, benefit to the taxpayer or to the rate payer. So the rate payer would not see any gain or loss. The loss would be that the monies being sent would be not able to be used by the county in the future. So that's the opportunity lost on doing this um, and proceeding in this manner. Um, so that's where we are. Um, it's coming back as um, we did not proceed to put it in the budget. I want to ask council, is this a, a, a need today? Like, do we have to make the decision today? And that's the question, like we're holding up a budget process. We're holding up our tendering process. Um, and this is not value added to our process of the budget, but we certainly can address it in a future conversation. Um, and that's where I'm wondering if this is uh, something that has to be dealt with immediately. Is it immediate need? Is there a reason they're buying the equipment tomorrow? The hospice is being built tomorrow. I don't think that is the case. All right. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. You know, we've often had uh, conversations around the table and various members have said, stay in your lane. I guess we're trying to decide what our lane is. Uh, and I certainly appreciate the fact of lack of clarity on what the intended use of that growth reserve is. And uh, I, I would caution council of uh, dispatching or using some of those funds without knowing exactly what the purpose of that fund is. I would say that uh, if uh, council in the future, like a f next week, two weeks, whatever it is, after I get some parameters on what that growth fund this purpose is for, if they want to make an expenditure, they can. Councillor Widner, and we still have a, a draft being prepared over here. But anyway. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I like the idea of just putting a pause on this. We need, we need to know what the parameters are. We just can't make them up. Once we know what the parameters are, that it'd be easier to make a decision. Mm -hmm. We have lots of growth coming in. A lot of this growth is going to be subsidized by the taxpayer already. And poor taxpayers under a lot of pressure these days, and we got to be very cognizant of that. We just can't keep pushing it off to the ratepayers. So maybe this would be more for private donations, but I would support we check and see what the parameters should be and make them clear. Thank you. Okay. Now, going back to Councillor Cookett, uh, have you got a draft? And let's hear the draft, and then we'll confirm whether you want that on the floor or not. <laughs> Resolved that County Council consider funding $250,000 a year for 10 years for an MRI at the St. Thomas Elgin General Hospital and $300,000 a year for four years for the hospice as part of the 2024 budget process. Okay, Councillor Cookett, do you want that on the floor today? 
I, I originally, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I originally thought that the hospice request was 200,000, which was m my original motion, but since uh, they haven't changed that, um, I think it's, it's valuable to, to put this on the floor, although um, if it goes on the floor and gets defeated, we can't bring it up again. Um, so um, I'm not sure at this point that That's I want to do that. That's why uh, so, I'm asking if you really yeah, want I, it on the floor today. So if we if we can defer the uh, the the amount uh, and pass the budget and still come back to this, then I have no reason to put this on the floor. Okay, that's reasonable. Nods, Councillor uh, Hens. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, just a comment, and I've long been a proponent of staying in your lane and doing what we're supposed to be doing around here. But having said that, um, senior levels of government, we know healthcare is, is not being funded properly. Mm -hmm. I see it in my own municipality. We are in the healthcare business. So I think this is an excellent discussion, probably long overdue, and I think we should continue this discussion. This is a difficult one. Mm -hmm. I find it extremely difficult. If I just put on my, my council hat, um, I, I wouldn't do it, but there's more to it than that. And I look at the residents in my municipality in the County of Elgin. Um, we deserve what the big centers have. We deserve what others have, such as an MRI or a hospice. We need to figure out what our role in all of that is. So I agree with the direction of this discussion that this should continue. I don't want to hold up a budget process because I think it's important. We all know what uh, timing of tendering is and getting our house in order. And I don't want to jeopardize that. So, and I also make the comment that I believe from my perspective, the county is in a, an enviable financial position. We are able to set money aside. I would like to be in that position. So I think there is opportunity, uh, not today, but down the road, to take a look at the request of the hospital and the hospice and see what we can do for them. Okay. Do I get consensus around council? Are you comfortable with just setting aside a decision on funding uh, those big requests and coming back at it later? and moving the budget along. Councillor Jaguar, you, you had your hand up? Uh, so it's, a, it's a yes, um, but I just want to be very clear then that the follow-up to me needs a sort of a three-pronged approach and to what Councillor Cook had said, I think we need some parameters around asks. Mm -hmm. There are policies um, utilized by other municipalities where the requester has to uh, a provide more information around budgets and, and percentages, but also where you can look at percentages of the operating budget of the organization to which you're making the request. And you're not gonna ask, for example, for more than 1% of the operating budget of that particular organization. Like we can we can look at that. So, um, so I would like, because I, I agree, we need to separate the asks and provide our requesters some parameters of what we expect to see and um, and then followed with the, the second, um, in parallel to that, are the parameters around the growth reserve. And also from staff hearing what else, like other than these requests, I presume there are other things that we need this growth reserve for. So what is the plan? Or So if we were to fund those um, requests, what else are we not funding? We need to, to see not only parameters, but also uh, projections. And the third aspect, because we talk about sort of us acting as a consequence of what the province is doing. Well, we shouldn't be doing that sort of in a, in a victim kind of um, based approach. I think we need to engage with the province and say, here's what we're willing to do, but here's what the source of the problem is. Mm -hmm. So I would like us to be very uh, visible, active, vocal um, in that conversation. We know AMO is 
pushing for a, a complete recalculation yeah. of the formula. We need to join that mm -hmm. very visibly. And because right now, unless we're going to keep spinning our wheels, unless we go to the source of the problem. So I would like to see the follow-up taking those three uh, prongs. I would agree with you entirely on that one, uh, particularly the fact that uh, why should they do it if we're willing to? So, and it's really interesting, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that staff will uh, come up with some parameters on on the uh, growth reserve. Maybe this is uh, an avenue where even the uh, growth planning steering committee might have an opportunity to help have some input as well. If if uh, staff are willing to, you know, well, hey, we'll just tell them where we want in and we'll do it. Okay. All right. So we call the, uh, I don't want to call it a gentleman's agreement, but I mean a, a council agreement uh, without putting, do you need a motion on the floor to suggest that we will revisit the, uh... okay, let's do it that way. It's cleaner. Uh, which brings us then back to the original recommendation of the budget from staff, except you're going to drop out the bylaw. Councillor Shiger. Thank you, Mr. Warden. So uh, one of the other items for decision today is around the, the steep act ask. Mm -hmm. So uh, to that, I wanted to clarify, and on the report it says that uh, they have not received any increases for many years. So I wanted to know, could we know how many years exactly have they been frozen at 30,000? Hit the button. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, in 2008, uh, the funding was increased. I believe that initially it was 15, and it was increased to 30,000 in 2008. And then in 2010, it was put into the museum's operating budget to, I guess, to stabilize the funding um, arrangement we had and take it out of the granting process. Given uh, you know how how essential the funds are to the operating budget of of the center, so that's the timeline. Yeah. Okay, just to clarify, since two thousand eight, then uh, we're moved to thirty thousand. So it's been considerable time. Yeah. Councilor Shakir. So thank you. So thank you for that information. So we put that over then sixteen years then if there had been incremental increases, mm -hmm. I think we'd be sitting more at 41,000. Probably. Um, so, so I wanna take that in consideration. I don't like the fact that we would be, we freeze, then we jump by 10,000 and we freeze. This is not a smart way for, for us and for them also as an organization to try to plan their funding. So I will say that I don't like the process, but now with the additional information, um, I can see where this 10,000 request is, is coming from, and it appears reasonable. And unlike other items, this item is a budget line item, which council has considered um, not as discretionary as, uh, as other lines because we made the commitment in previous years. So I would support the um, increase by 10,000 and also recommend that we do not use this freeze, jump freeze approach in the future. I would agree with you. It's a lot easier if it was simply pegged to the CPI and adjusted annually. You know, it from a planning perspective, you're right, it's difficult. Uh, any other comments? Do you want to hear the recommendation forward and then have further discussion? Okay, do you have a comment first, Jen? I do. In my recommendation, I do not have a CPI increase no. um, allocated, so that might be something we would want to add to that particular one. Of course, it's always dangerous to give without being asked. But anyway, Catherine, can we have the recommendation then, please? Mm -hmm. 
Resolved that the membership for SCORE be approved at $30,000 for the 2024 budget year and that the additional costs for the STPAC membership in the amount of $10,000 be approved for the 2024 budget year and that funding for the hospice and St. Thomas Elgin General Hospital MRI be considered at a later date in 2024 and that guidelines for the use of the growth reserve be established and brought forward for council consideration and that staff provide council with a report regarding projected uses for the growth reserve and that council advocate for a recalculation of healthcare funding, the healthcare funding formula and that the proposed draft budget outlined in Appendix A be approved with a tax rate increase of 3.79% and that council approve the preparation of the budget bylaw to be considered at the March 12th, 2024 meeting. Yes, Councillor Jaguar. Um, just process wise, and we haven't had a discussion on the score item yet. Uh, so I was wondering if we could actually consider each resolution independently because this doesn't allow any nuance between All right. one recommendation and, and the other. We can either separate the question or have the conversation on uh, score at this point. Um, I have Councillor Sloan. Oh, thank you. Through you, Warden. Yeah, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. You've got a, we're voting on a $10,000 ask extra for the art gallery, $2.5 million for the hospital, and overall whether we want option one, two, and three together. Yeah. So I have various views on those, and they're not all the same. Yeah, yeah. So I agree with yeah. Councillor Jaguar. Okay, so how do you wish to tackle this? Do you wish to separate the questions? Please. We can do it that way. We can do it that way. Councillor Noble. It's you, Mr. Warden. I'd like to talk about SCORE before we vote on the art gallery, just because if we're going to increase our ask for the art gallery, and, and I think mm -hmm. SCORE is very important, and if we're starting to decide where we're spending money, it's, I think those two conversations would be nice to have together. Told you this was going to be fun. All right. We have a motion by Councillor Shiger to separate the question. And I assume, uh, Councillor Sloan, you're willing to second that. Have you got something, Catherine? All right. You don't really. Well, it's a request to separate the question, but it's cleaner if we do it this way. All right. All right. Results that the membership for SCORE be approved at $30,000 for the 2024 budget year. Okay. Put it on the floor. Let's have a mover and seconder and then have a discussion. Does that work? Councillor Noble, Councillor Jaguar. Okay, discussion. Now we're all quiet. Okay. Pick me. Yeah. Counts, uh, excuse, we, we could elevate you. Yeah. <laughs> just put your name on a ballot. I just want to make a comment on SCORE and on the museum, just so that council is aware. Those have been included in the 3.79%. So there's no increase. However, if you don't approve it, there would be a slight, very slight and it works out to sense uh, decrease. One thing to keep in mind regarding the uh, the SCORE membership, uh, it's a two-year commitment, basically. If, if council chooses not to participate in the future, from an honor point of view and from the bylaws of SCORE, you're funding it for 24 and you're out in 25. That's how it works. unless you wish to have some reputational risk and just bail. And I don't think that's an honorable way to do it because it's been done in the past and shameful. But going back to SCORE, back on November the 14th, the executive director and the chair were present and gave an update. And I think they did a pretty, pretty good job of putting some metrics before you. And I printed them off last night just so they were before me. They were looking at the financial impact from 2020 to 2022, and just for your recollection, 
uh, the five counties fund uh, the uh, the organization to the tune of at that time twenty five thousand dollars a year. So one hundred twenty five thousand. With that one hundred twenty five thousand membership fee, they turn around and they use that to leverage different uh, grant programs and uh, partnership funding arrangements. But over that two year period, it was reported to us that they had leveraged nine point two million of program funding into the region. Now I realize that Elgin County is one of the few out there that lacks a community transit program, but SCORE was one of those organizations that actually coordinated this and got it spun up. And you have the Southwest Community Transit running now in nine uh, communities across uh, Southwestern Ontario. Four of them are in the SCORE region, Elgin lacks. But I also digress uh, at a, uh, the Roma conference sitting in front of the Minister of Transportation he seemed very interested considering the provincial investment that's going on in the region. He wanted to talk more about community transit. So I think there's an opportunity if we, if this council's thinking and wants to go down that road, we can have that conversation with the minister. It was, it was interesting uh, that uh, they sent his contact information out to me the next day. I think that's a positive sign. So just keeping that in mind. Uh, the ask is up 5,000 from what it was. But those uh, fees were established in 2010 and hadn't changed for 14 years. I guess 13 years. I, it's more than just an advocacy group. It's a project management group. And yes, I'm I'm very biased. Councilor Widner. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'm thinking score at this time would be a good investment as no other point in time are we poised for so much investment and growth come in this area. I don't know why we would shut it off now and lose some opportunities. Like you say, $125,000 invested leveraged 9.2 million. That's pretty good. We'd all take that for an investment, but um, I think I would support it because I don't know why we would shut it off now. We had more growth coming than we've ever seen. Thank you. I suppose in fairness, I should have said it was 250,000, but you know, over a two year period. Um, I would say that a uh, couple of other pieces I want to add into it, uh, and I should have before. We've got a pretty good ECDEV unit, uh, fledgling ECDEV unit, getting off the ground and going. And uh, they're doing, they're enthusiastic and they're good. We're not up to the same bench strike as uh, our partner in the city of St. Thomas, but we also have the opportunity to harness and leverage some synergies with our neighbors. And just to keep in mind that uh, our uh, manager of uh, economic development, tourism, and strategic initiatives also chairs the staff resource committee of SCORE. I think that positions us in a good spot to take advantage of some things. And if you're interested, the annual, the AGM is on Thursday in Tilsonburg. We'd be glad to have you. Yes, Council, uh, Deputy Warden Jones. Uh, just a question with regards to the benefit of SCORE, what percentage of that growth came to Elgin County? Because I know none come to the South. Well, that's a very good question, uh, considering the fact that uh, Elgin bailed on SCORE for 10 years and wasn't part of it. But during that period, the uh, former CN, well, they still are CN lines, were reopened and petitioned through extensive lobbying uh, full from not only uh, the SCORE board, but also from Cephas Panchow, and the town of Tilsonburg, you have a short line rail provider which runs along the industrial lands and into St. Thomas through Elmer, through Bayham, Malahide, Tilsonburg, and ends up uh, at Cortland. It's only 27 kilometers long, but if I recall the uh, numbers, they're talking about, uh, oh, contributes roughly 170 million a year. So it affects a total of seven companies at this point but there's opportunities for growth, particularly in along the industrial lands in Elmer. It runs ICPG, uh, you know, product out as well as future transfer. But I thought if I understood and recall it, uh, those companies have just under 400 employees that they service. Short line rail is one of them, like the geo rail runs that one. Southland also runs the CP rails, which come north of the 
industrial lands back into Pillsworth. So you've got two short rail providers that are one. The community transit program, I yeah, we weren't part of it. We didn't get it. Bayham was part of it. You know what? We have a bus. It's only part time, but it started as part of that private per, you know, uh, pilot program. Uh, and I would say that if we want our interest in an east west community transit program, why would we reinvent the wheel? Go use what's out there. There's opportunities. Did it reach all the way across the county? No, not at this point, but there are opportunities to do it. And I would agree with uh, Councillor Widner <laughs> with all the growth that's coming. Why wouldn't we use all the help and synergy development we can get? Councillor uh, Tellier. Thank you, Warden. Yes, there's uh, to speak to uh, Deputy Warden's uh, point there. There's uh, opportunities that don't reach other parts of uh, the county, but the opportunities that we have that could reach are something we don't want to close doors to. So I would support this as well. I've done a little bit of education in the short time here and time before. And um, I just think, uh, once again, any anything we have going on that could help the rest of uh, the county, that we should support it and move forward. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Councillor Corkett? Thank you, Mr. Wood. And just a quick, quick couple of comments. Uh, I was around when SCORE started, and uh, I was also around when we dumped SCORE. Um, but I support the the $30,000 uh, to, to, to keep SCORE running because we can't afford not to, I think, uh, because they will provide a, a, a mechanism for growth uh, one question I do have is that statistics are kind of always interesting. You say the two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars leverage nine point two million. Do we have a list of, of of all of the companies that were involved with that? We do have a list. I have a programming uh, resulting from advocacy efforts, uh, partner supported, as well as uh, financial and direct impact. That's from the November fourteenth uh, presentation. Oh, right. Uh, it's right. available uh, online, uh, or you can have my copy if you want. No, that's fine. I remember now. Thank you. Yep. Any other discussion? We ready for the question? Okay. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. It's carried. So the next one then is the DPAC. You want to deal with that one? Okay, please. Resolved that the additional costs for the STPAC membership in the amount of $10,000 be approved for the 2024 budget year. Do we have a mover and seconder for that one? Councillor Jaguar? Councillor Cooker? Okay. Yeah. Any comments, questions? So, please. Councillor Sloan? Thank you, Warden, through you. Um, when we first got this request last fall, um, I, Councillor Shagir was going to give an update on exactly what it would be used for. A couple of points. Elgin County gives twice what St. Thomas does from the last time I looked on their light item for their budget. So our $30,000 is twice what St. Thomas gives, if not a little bit more. So we started the discussion by saying, okay, well, it shouldn't should have gone up, but it didn't go up. So now that it hasn't gone up, we're going to put it up 30%. And I'd just like some clarification. I know you're on the board, Councillor Shiger, but what services aren't going to be offered or what services are offered that won't be offered with the extra $10,000? I, I have some issues with going from exactly to quote you, a jump of $10,000. So through the warden, I just wanted some clarification and, a, and, a, and an understanding just that I'm right with St. Thomas where the art gallery is located gives less than $15,000. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Jaguar. Uh... Uh, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Warden, I, I won't comment on uh, St. Thomas's decision. And um, I think that's that's theirs to make and we don't need to make a, a proportional amount um, or contribution. Um, what I would say is that, yes, initially the jump, the 10000 dollars surprised me, um, even as a member of the board, and uh, we asked for a more specific requests and a stronger business case. Um, that's not always easy to do, but I think it became very clear once um, I learned that it was frozen since 2008. 
So what I have observed as a member of the board is the issue on wages, for example. So we're very, very fortunate on the board to, um, to have staff that are dedicated that have not had uh, wage increases for many, many years. It's becoming very challenging to recruit um, anyone. And uh, so we rely on volunteers. So we're increasing our reliance on volunteers, which is not you know, a sustainable way to run an organization. And um, we're all aware of the risks associated with that. So I think, and I, again, when you put it in context, so context is everything. You put it in context of all their costs, insurance costs, we're all aware, um, their, uh, and, and their operating costs um, have all increased um, more than 2% per year. So what would be cut is programming. And then it, that's how you, you get less and less involvement if you have less programming um, available. But I am proud of how, perhaps unlike other organizations I've seen that, and how they're being creative in generating revenue and using making sure the facilities is used for many purposes and available in the community, which like I said, creates revenue. Their fundraising is uh, very, very active um, and provides more than certainly our contribution at, um, at the county. So hopefully that clarifies further. Thank you for your comments. Uh, additional questions? Comments? Uh, Deputy Warden? Thank you, Mr. Warden. Just a comment. It, I, I remember when St. Thomas almost backed out of the deal mm. together, and obviously they've come to the table to some extent, but it would be nice if there's an even playing field. 50-50 uh, seems like where it should be, but I know uh, Mayor Preston has made comments that they want to work together, maybe. Should, maybe should they any up for the right? Here's a good start. Let's put that in uh, in the arsenal of uh, of a conversation of when it comes up. Um, I know that for various other uh, programming, it's prorated based on population, but uh, still, even if it was prorated that way, it's a long way from where it should be, in my opinion. But that's all it is, and I agree with you. I should not be commenting on the city's. Uh, contribution. Councillor uh, Noble. Through you, Mr. Warden, I think it's important to say that we also do a very good job of supporting our museum, and and we do a, we put a good amount of money towards that. And I feel like they're they're both a cultural um, investment, but uh, I know we put a good amount of money to the to the museum. So I just want to say that. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Any additional comments? All right. Uh, let's have the question. Okay. Then how about all in favor? I just, all in favor then of funding STPAC. Okay. Any opposed? Okay. It's carried. Thank you. Next one. Mr. Mark. That funding for the hospice and St. Thomas Elgin General Hospital MRI be considered at a later date in 2024. Okay, do we have a mover and seconder for that? Councillor Cookett and uh, Councillor Telly. Do we need any further comment on that? Are we good? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's carried. Next. Resolves that guidelines for the use of the growth reserve fund be established and brought forward for council consideration and that staff provide council with a report regarding projected uses for the growth reserve fund and that council advocate for a recalculation of the health care funding formula. Yeah, uh, mover and seconder. Councillor Hens and Councillor Noble. Discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. One more. Resolved that the proposed draft budget outlined in Appendix A be approved with a tax rate increase of 3.79% and 
that Council approve the preparation of a budget bylaw to be considered at the March 12th, 2024 meeting. We have a mover and seconder, Deputy Warden Jones and uh, Councillor Widner. Any further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, it's carried. Thank you. You take a piece and uh, treat it like eating an elephant and you get through it one bite at a time. There's one additional piece here that uh, it's not on the, uh, it, it's part of, it was from the budget committee. It didn't necessarily make it through to the uh, recommendation stage uh, for council's consideration, but I'm going to ask. There was discussion uh, regarding the uh, funding for Southwest Public Health, you recall. And if we go back to the Roma conference where the minister made the commitment that uh, they will fund the 75%, we understand that with uh, Southwest Public Health that the provincial funding is only 62%. There was a uh, discussion around the budget committee of perhaps maybe we should add our voice to the chorus and send correspondence to uh, the minister reminding them of the shortfall. Let's face it, it's costing us extra dollars to fund Southwest Public Health because the province isn't living up to their commitment. Is council interested in uh, a bit of an advocacy effort on that behalf? Deputy Warden Jones. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, so obviously we know the uh, cost of inflation for the past year. Um, the province in its infinite wisdom decided on 1%. Yes. And we still have mandated programs that we have to fulfill. And that's why we have an increase. Mm -hmm. That's put, put in as simple as possible. We have a mandated program we have to do, and 1% isn't cutting it. Correct. Uh, go back and- Yes. Yes, we need to. I know all the health units are in the same boat. We're mm -hmm. all lobbying, but I think Ms. Pally should be as well. Councillor Noble? Through Mr. Warden, if the province cut their budget by 1%, how did we get a 55% increase? That's my question. So somewhere along the lines, there's there's something that doesn't quite add up. It seems like a simple, obvious thing, but I don't know what it is. Okay. I'd like to have more information. Well, it's simple. Uh, even within illustrated within the uh, the doc, budget document itself of inflation over the last uh, four years, and if the province is only committed to one percent increase rather than the uh, 3.3 that we had this year to 6.79 the year before, like 4% before, you know what I'm trying to get at? It it soon grows pretty quickly. And uh, yeah, Deputy Warden. And, and the fact is we have union negotiations and I would say probably 90% of the costs associated with Southwest Public Health is labor. Okay. A little bit of building in there. Yeah. So again, the question then uh, before council is, uh, are you interested uh, in a little advocacy effort? Uh, shall we prepare a letter? We may not get anything out of it, but uh, at the same token, if we don't try, then we're complicit. Yep, Deputy Borden. Just a further note, I saw an email from uh, Cynthia this morning, uh, looking to set up times with the uh, various uh, councils to uh, uh, promote what's happening this coming year. So uh, the health unit will be coming here at some point once they send a date. Okay. And, and that'll be a perfect chance to ask questions. Thank you for that. So then I'm, I'm going to ask uh, our representatives for Southwest Public Health, do we hold off on that letter until after the Southwest or just send one off to Minister Jones? If that's the will of council. We need a motion for that? We should. Have, have you got some wording crafted for us? Thank you. Resolves that council advocate to the Ministry of Health to fulfill their 75% public health funding commitment. Do we have a mover for that? Deputy Warden Jones, a seconder? Okay. Councillor Tellier, you had your hand up and I apologize. Okay. Any discussion on that or any further? Are we okay for the question? All in favor? Okay, that's carried. Thank you. We have been sitting here for well over an hour and three quarters. Anyone need a break? Let's take a 10 minute break. I'll see if I can stagger up and find a coffee.
and we will resume, uh, say, within 10 minutes. Better if I turn the mic on. Welcome back. And uh, good discussion this morning so far. Uh, we are going to be proceeding on with section uh, seven, but before then, uh, Councillor Jaguer, you found some stuff during the break just for clarification for council. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Warden. I just wanted to clarify, uh, I had a chance to pull up the budget for the contribution from St. Thomas in 2023 was 50,000, five zero. So I don't want any misinformation floating out there as far as their contribution. I realize it is down in the past. I think they've given as high as, uh, contributed as high as 70,000. Um, and I can't confirm yet what um, their budget, what they have passed for 2024. Um, but for the record, I wanted to clarify that. I doubt it is lower than 50 uh, for 2024. Thank you. Thank you for that. Perfect. Okay, let's move on then with uh, Section 7, Council Correspondence Item for Consideration. 7.1711 was a letter from Mayor Andrew Sloan, Port Stanley 200 Committee Co-Chair, requesting a donation of $15,000 for the Port 200 Celebrations. Councillor Noble, did you have something you wanted to contribute to that? Oh, yes. Um, could we defer this until Carolyn and Councillor Sloan are back? That's entirely up to you if you wish to put that motion on the floor. I would like to. Anyone interested in seconding that? Councillor Widner. All right. So a motion for a ref a deferral. Councillor Jaguer, you'd like to comment first? Yes, please, Mr. Yes. Warden. Um, since there is a bit more time, could I also request that uh, the, the request come with more information? Yep. Um, at the risk of sounding repetitive, I think we need context, we need a budget, we need what is 15,000, um, where does that fit? And on our side, what is our policy? Um, or maybe this is one another area of policy we need around mm -hmm. sponsorship. But um, I think more information on the budget of all the, the programming that's planned for the festivities would be appreciated. Thank you for that, uh, Deputy uh, Warden Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I would echo the same. Uh, we require this of any uh, request that we have a budget and mm -hmm. understand what where the money is going. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I know that in a casual conversation with Councillor uh, Noble, I suggested, you know, it'd be cleaner if it was a motion coming from Central Elgin itself, but just sending you home with that idea. So the motion is on the floor for deferral. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So 7-2, the consent agenda. We have uh, three items before us, four items, excuse me. The uh, resolution from the Northeastern Manitoulin Island and the Islands requesting the province implement funding stream for wastewater and water systems. 722 from the Township of uh, McMurrah, Monteith, lobbying the provincial government to amend the Municipal Act and Municipal Elections Act, prohibiting people with unpardoned criminal record from becoming a candidate in the municipal elections. 723, Mike Baker retirement invitation, and 724, the Elgin Clean Water 2023 annual report. Does anyone have any comments uh, or questions regarding any of the uh, items on the consent agenda? Uh, Deputy Warden Jones? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. I guess uh, from uh, Northeastern Manitou and, and the islands, uh, obviously, uh, infrastructure money is desperately needed. I think any place in small, uh, on, uh, rural, on, uh, small rural Ontario, I think it's, uh, I, I would support this. Okay. Any other comments? Other than again, just to highlight the, uh, the invitation for March the 28th, if you're available, I would recommend, uh, please drop in. Mike's been a mainstay around here for a long time. And, uh, and then uh, I would also like to highlight the Elgin Clean Water Program. The county does support this, and uh, they do some pretty good work. And uh, I congratulate them on what they were able to achieve in 2023. So if you got a motion to capture, thank you. Resolves that correspondence items 7.21 to 7.24 be received and filed. 
or did you? And? And that the County of Elgin, Corporation of the County of Elgin, support the resolution from the town of North Eastern Manitoulin and the islands to advocate to the provincial and federal levels of government to make them aware that rural and small urban water and wastewater systems are financially unsustainable and advocate to the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, the Rural Ontario Municipalities Association and the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to examine the unaffordability of water and wastewater system operational costs is systematic, is systematic and provin provincially and nationally. Sorry, that the unaffordability of water and wastewater system operational cost is systematic and provincially provincially and nationally. It's a mouthful. Uh, willing to move that, uh, Deputy Warden? And uh, Councillor Hensch will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, Section 8, other business, statements and inquiries by members. Uh, just to uh, put a quick note out there that if you haven't uh, already, there is a card circulating for uh, Councillor Latham. Please sign it if you have the opportunity. Uh, secondly, I had some uh, text correspondence with uh, Mrs. Latham last evening. She tells me that uh, Richard has been moved out of intensive care. He is uh, still a long row ahead of him. Uh, a lot of challenges, but he's uh, has his phone back with him. If you wish to reach out by phone, or he is even receiving visitors. I wish I knew which hospital. I assume it's uh, Victoria, isn't it? Thank you, Warden. Uh, Victoria Hospital, fifth floor. At least that's where he was. So I'm not sure where he got moved to now, but that's where he will. Okay. So we uh, will keep Richards uh, in our thoughts and uh, wish him well. Yes, uh, Councillor Hens. Yeah, Mr. Warden, uh, to Council, I actually did reach out to Richard and he answered the phone yesterday. And you can imagine sitting in a hospital room as long as him. So get a minute, give him a call. He'd love to chat. There's not much else to do where he is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you. Any other statements or uh, from members? Okay. Notice of motion. Matters of urgency. Uh, we do have an addition. Resolved that a closed session item related to a personnel matter under Municipal Act Section 239.2 be added to the closed session agenda. Okay, this will require a two thirds vote in order to uh, put it on the agenda. Uh, I know the curiosity is peaking. So do we have a mover and seconder? Deputy Warden Jones and uh, Councillor Jaguar. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, so now we'll be mo moving into closed meeting items. Resolved that we do now proceed into closed meeting session in accordance with the Municipal Act to discuss the following matters under Municipal Act Section 239-2. Closed meeting item number one, closed meeting minutes, February 13th, 2024. Closed meeting item number two, boundary adjustment matter, verbal, under sections H and K, and closed meeting item number three, personnel matter, under section B. Okay, mover and seconder, please. Councillor Widner and uh, Councillor Noble, all in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Okay. Welcome back. Uh, motion to rise and report. Resolves that we do now rise and report. We have a mover and seconder, please. Deputy Warden Jones, uh, Councillor Hentz, all in favor? That's carried. Closed meeting item number one, the closed meeting minutes. Resolves that the closed meeting minutes from the meeting held on February 13th, 2024 be adopted. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Noble, Councillor Hentz, all in favor? That's carried. Closed meeting item number two, the boundary adjustment matter, verbal. Resolves that the confidential verbal report from Warden Ketchaba be received for information. Mover and seconder, please. Councillor Tellier and uh, Councillor Noble. I hope I am pronouncing that correctly. Close. To the warden. Yeah, Tellier. I E R is I A. In I A. So. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Perfect. 
It's always good to learn something. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Motion 9-3, yes. Both that a confidential verbal report from the Chief Administrative Officer be received for Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Deputy Warden Jones, Councillor Noble. All in favor? That's carried, thank you. Section 11, motion to adopt recommendations from the Committee of the Whole. Resolved that we do now adopt recommendations of the Committee of the Whole. We have a mover and seconder, Councillor Hentz. Councillor Noble, you must be hungry. All in favor? Carried. Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I just mean you're so quick to uh, second uh, motions and move us along. I thought that was great. Yep. Uh, consideration of the bylaws, section 12. Being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Municipal Council of the Corporation of the County of Elgin, resolved that bylaw number 2408 now be read a first, second, and third time and finally passed. Do we have a mover and seconder for that? Councillor Widener, Councillor Cookett will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Which brings us to the adjournment motion. Resolved that we do now adjourn at 1128 AM to meet again on March 12th, 2024 at nine o'clock AM. Okay, Councillor Woodner will move. Deputy Warden Jones will second. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today and thank you for your interest in local governance. Have a first spring thunderstorm day. Have a good one. Thank you.